Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Yuko Kaifu, and I'm the president of Japan House Los Angeles. It's my pleasure to welcome you all. And it's the third webinar series of Rethinking of Map, developed by Professors Abe and Professor Oshima to explore the concept of Ma in different aspects of culture and life. As many of you probably know, the concept of Ma or Ma is translated as space between or interval. And it was predominantly used in the architectural world, but we thought that the concept is not relevant only in the world of architecture, but also in many aspects of our cultural life. In today's webinar, professors Abe and Oshima will be in conversation with Prairie Stuart Wolf, a writer and photographer based in Karatsu in Saga Prefecture in Kyushu in Japan. She's also producer of the Japanese food and culture website, Cultivated Days. I saw it and it's very beautiful, informative and appetizing as well. So please check it out after the webinar is over. Today, she'll be joined by professors Abe and Oshima to discuss the role of Ma in contemporary Japanese cuisine. Before we meet our webinar hosts, I'd like to go over some housekeeping announcements. Please turn your attention to the screen. The audience is muted and videos are turned off. The audience chat has been activated, so please engage in your conversation throughout the program. If you have questions, please use the Q&A bar to send them to the speakers anytime during the program. We will try our best to cover as many questions as possible. We are recording this webinar today and we'll post an edited version on our website at the later date. Now, as a reminder to us all of what Ma means, I would like to share a three minute video about Ma. Please watch. Japan House Los Angeles presents The Rethinking of Ma webinar series. Ma is a very common word in Japanese. It can be pronounced in many ways, such as ken, kan, aida, ai, awai, and hazama, indicating the different meanings. It also connotes various key terms like human, space, comrade, day or night, year or month, or period, by being combined with other characters. Ma is a very important word among Japanese to communicate with each other and to express ways to address the world. Ma literally means space, or gap, interval, distance, or period of time, duration, interval. We can see this meaning graphically in the original ancient character as it depicts both a gate and the moon in between. Ma is thus literally the empty space defined by the gate where moonlight is shining through. Yet, how do we experience Ma? We can see it literally represented by the Shinto Tori Gate and the space in between. Moreover, we can see that in Japan, space is thought to be a planar, two-dimensional compound, not space as the sense of an enclosed, three-dimensional volume conceived in Western culture. Depth is created by a combination of planes. Meaning is derived from the junction of two dimensions with several axes of time. So we can experience this sense of Ma in walking through the series of gates shaped by the particular moment in time, such as in the autumn as the yellow ginkgo leaves have fallen to the ground. In walking through the gates, the light is ever-changing, offering different views at each interval. Ma is experienced progressively through intervals of spatial designation or intervals of moments in time. In this sense, it integrates time and space together. This notion of time and space, represented by Ma, can be found in many forms of Japanese culture, such as architecture, garden design, painting, music, performance, martial arts, literature, and daily life, creating its foundation. In 1978, renowned architect Arata Isozaki presented this notion in the interdisciplinary Ma Space Time in Japan exhibition as the unifying concept of Japanese artistic culture and introduced Ma to the international, cultural, and intellectual scene. Here, this indigenous notion of order and orientation underscored the simultaneity of time and space in a global context and has become one of the most famous conceptual keywords from Japan.
Nearly half a century has passed since the original Ma exhibition. In our era of the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond, our notions of time and space have certainly taken on new dimensions with a reorientation of living and public space between local and global contexts. The impact of technology is transforming traditional relationships among time and space, and our life is on a new frontier. Is the notion of Ma still relevant to address the multiple forms of Japanese culture popular around the world? Or has Ma taken on new meanings? Can Ma be a critical notion to give us clues to understand the new conditions we are facing now? We thus present the Rethinking of Ma webinar series to contemplate these questions. Thank you. It's always helpful to refresh our memory and learn something new, isn't it? So now it's my pleasure to introduce our host for today's webinar. Hitoshi Abe is professor in the Department of Architecture and Urban Design and director of the Terasaki Center for Japanese Studies, both at UCLA. He's also principal at AHA or Atelier Hitoshi Abe, an architecture design firm based in the United States and Japan. Ken Tadashi Oshima is professor in the Department of Architecture at University of Washington, where he teaches in the areas of transnational architectural history, theory, representation, and design. He has also been a visiting professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, and most recently at UCLA. I now like to invite them onto the screen. Hitoshi and Ken, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, kai -san. And everybody, welcome to Rethinking of Ma webinar series at Japan House in Los Angeles. My name is Hitoshi Abe. I'll be your host today together with Ken Tadashi Oshima-san in Seattle. Hi, Ken. How Hello. are you over there? <laughs> this webinar explores the new understanding of Ma. One of the most important terms describing the concept space and time constituting Japanese culture. In this year, we invite four renowned figures from four different fields of art, Japanese cultural scene and discuss about the relationship between their works and the notion of Ma and exchange the idea how it can be adapted to describe about contemporary notion of time and space today. So tonight we will discuss Ma in contemporary Japanese cuisine. This is something that I was looking for. We ask our guests to make a statement about their understanding of Ma at the beginning, and then the short presentation of their three projects and the discussion about them will follow. We set 10 minutes of Q&A time at the end of this event, so please use the Zoom Q&A function to communicate your questions and comments with us. Now, Ken San will introduce our guest tonight. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Prairie to this ongoing conversation on Ma. Prairie is truly a Renaissance person who, as a writer, photographer, and guide, will help us consider this spatial temporal aspect of contemporary Japanese cuisine. So Prairie originally hails from Putney, Vermont, with its population of 2,700. And then in 2007, she moved with her partner, a ceramicist in Kyushu with its whopping population of 117,000. So before her time in Japan, Prairie lived on the West Coast attending Stanford University and also spent a semester abroad in England at Oxford University. Her travels continued to Ireland to research James Joyce and also to Guatemala, giving her perspectives on human experiences across culture. So we'll see this tonight. Um, and we'll, upon arriving at Karatsu, Prairie recognized the great depth and beauty of Japanese culinary traditions and wanted to know more about the fascinating ingredients she used and the techniques that daily transformed them into such exquisite dishes as I believe we'll hear about today and be tantalized by. Beyond today's webinar, as uh, Kaifu-san mentioned, you can explore the website Cultivated Days that really introduces the seasonal stories, and recipes, culinary immersion programs, and hosted travel focused on the people, principles, and practices shaping Japan's cuisine and culinary culture that Prairie produces. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Prairie to uh, talk about her perceptions of Ma. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for that very kind introduction. 
And uh, thank you to everyone at Japan House LA for inviting me to be part of this series on Rethinking Ma. So just as a sort of a beginning, as I mentioned to Professor Abe and Professor Oshima in preparing for this presentation, thinking about the concept of Ma is relatively new for me. But in preparing for today, it became increasingly clear that many of the ideas and concepts about Japanese cuisine that I have been thinking about and writing about for over a decade now, particularly the culinary concepts and practices that really resonate with me on an intuitive level, they all align beautifully with the concept of Ma and can be understood as expressions of Ma. So that was really exciting to me to realize that I've been thinking about and experiencing Ma all this time without being fully aware of it sometimes. And I think that's true for many of us because Ma is something we don't actively think about in our day-to-day -day life much, but it really is embedded in our lives in subtle and profound ways. So the example we saw in the introduction of walking through the gates and understanding Ma as the integration of space and time, I think is a really great framework to interpret the entire arc of a meal from the climate and landscape in which ingredients are grown to, you know, they could be wild or cultivated to the decisions that the cook makes in the kitchen and how food is presented in vessels and also into the experience of someone who's eating a meal. So those are the aspects of Japanese cuisine that I would like to go into more today. I think many are familiar with the idea that Japanese cuisine expresses seasonality. And that's something I definitely would like to discuss in relation to Ma today. The passage of time marked by the changing seasons is a really important element in many aspects of culture and spirituality in Japan. And for those who might not be intimately familiar with how seasonality is measured in Japan, I just wanted to take a minute to elaborate because it's such a foundational element in the culinary culture. In Japan, the notion of season goes far beyond the four major divisions of spring, summer, fall, and winter. And in relation to food and agriculture in Japan, the year is actually divided into 24 seasons known as seki. And then from there, each of those 24 seasons are further divided into three seasons. So we have a total of 72 micro seasons in a year. And having cooked and eaten in Japan for many years now, I can really assure you that this is not just a concept. It really is expressed in the food, particularly in the more elevated cuisine like kaiseki and also in home cooking, especially if the cook is enthusiastic about fresh ingredients. It definitely plays a big role in my life as a cook. And I think the way that food expresses seasonality and marks the passage of time is one area where we can really see Ma in the cuisine. Another area is definitely in the presentation. In Japan, we really cannot separate food from tableware. Unlike in the West where we rely on the white plate to sort of just fade away into the background to be unassuming and be in service of the food. Um, in Japan, importance is placed on the choice of the vessel because it's seen as a key element of presentation. The vessels themselves have character and have intrigue and it's the relationship between that vessel and the food that defines plating in Japan. In the case of a room or a building, we can see that the structure itself defines how we utilize and experience the space contained within it. And I think this is equally true with tableware. The vessel provides a space to contain the food. It's sort of a three-dimensional canvas. And this relationship between the food and vessel, how one shapes the perception of the other, um, I think is an essential expression of Ma. And then as a cook, you know, one who really just enjoys being in the kitchen with seasonal ingredients, I feel that Ma exists in the kitchen each time we prepare a meal. Just in the act of arriving in the kitchen, deciding on the ingredients to use, preparing a flavor combination that suits the mood and the season, and then reaching for a vessel that's appropriate, not just for its size or shape, but also for its color and its character and how it will harmonize with the food. Each of those decisions really stack one upon the other to create the experience of a meal. And when I sit down to eat, I can feel all of that in the flavors and the aesthetics of the meal. I really, I feel like I can experience the result of time and space lining up to create a unique perspective um, and one that exists really only in that moment. So Ma really does exist across the entire arc of a meal, and that's what we'll be exploring together today. So with that, I'd love to go ahead and start the first slideshow and the first presentation. So I'd like to begin today with where a meal begins and with the ingredients and talk about Ma in flavor and cooking. 
We heard in the introduction that Ma is experienced progressively through intervals of time and space. And I think this concept really is particularly suited to being a model through which we can talk about Ma in flavor. Starting with basic ingredients, it could be produce or fish or one of the many fermented seasonings that we rely on in the kitchen. The taste of an ingredient is the result of a layering of moments in time. Taste is a record of a certain progression of temperature and light and moisture. And specifically in the case of a cultivated ingredient, it's the layering of all of the decisions and actions of the farmer or the producer. And in that way, I like to think that ma exists in flavor and that taste is a result of a progression of intervals or moments in time. I mentioned seasonality as one of the first concepts that comes to mind when people talk about Japanese cuisine. And this is not unique to Japanese cuisine in my view, but I think the intentionality of it is unique and makes it more prominent and more visible than it might be in other culinary traditions. Japanese cuisine is intimately tied to the natural world, to the landscape and the climate. Japan is an island nation and it was closed off to the rest of the world for much of its history. So food has developed over the centuries in tandem with a reliance on and a respect for nature specifically the changing state of nature as the year progresses through the seasons. Seasonality is a significant aspect in both the choice of ingredients and in the presentation and the aesthetics of food as well. When food is served, the appearance first captures our senses and tells us something about the current season. Oftentimes it's the garnish that's the first direct clue of what season we're in at the moment. For me, from a culinary perspective, as a cook living in an agrarian landscape, I really feel this in my daily life. Particularly starting in spring through early summer, I do a lot of foraging for wild vegetables and I can viscerally feel the micro seasons changing from week to week. Moving through these micro seasons is like walking the path through the gates that we saw in the introduction. The flavors we experience at the table, they're an internal experience that reflects the external world outside our window or our door. We saw the kanji character for Ma in the intro, and for me, this notion of shifting my gaze from my plate up to the view outside my window is like looking through the opening in the gate through which you can see the moonlight. For me, this is Ma, an expression of Ma. I'd like to briefly talk about the act of cooking itself as well, which is the gateway through which seasonal ingredients become seasonal flavors. I think another way to think about Ma is this state of potential. You can think of it as silence as opposed to sound or absence as opposed to excess. And this connects to a principal tenet of cooking in the tradition of Japanese cuisine. Most of the techniques in the kitchen and the use of seasonings are about removing everything that isn't necessary in order to reveal an ingredient's purest flavor. A while back, I had the great honor of spending quite a bit of time with the head chef at Kodaiji Wakuden, which is one of the great traditional restaurants of Kyoto. And he defined the difference between Western and Japanese cooking in a really clear way by saying that in the West, we use a lot of oils or animal fats like butter for seasoning our food. And these ingredients tend to overpower or at least combine with other flavors in a way that makes them very present. The ingredient's natural flavor becomes secondary to the seasoning. In Japanese cooking, the goal is really the opposite. Here we use dashi as the fundamental seasoning. And dashi is essentially liquid umami. So it boosts and it intensifies the flavors of vegetables and grains without competing with them. So when the aim of the cook is to really intensify the inherent natural taste of an ingredient, I think dishes can more distinctly express seasonality. Japanese cuisine is ever changing with the seasons and flavor is not fixed. It's really this result of space and time lining up to create a unique experience. And as the seasons change, so do our moods and our constitutions and our cravings. So these culinary moments really grow out of an evolving external and internal elements that dictate what we eat. And I see this relationship between the food on your plate and the weather outside your window as an expression of ma. Beautiful, beautiful presentation, Brady. It's kind of interesting that the way you described about this Japanese cuisine so that uh, you are actually extracting sort of a seasonable flavor from each ingredient through the act of cooking. So you are kind of, right, instead of creating it, you are extracting it. 
And it's almost like uh, the act of cooking acts as a kind of a one to gate, mm. right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then that way, actually, you can get the sense of space and the motion and a light and uh, your cooking, at, at least uh, your understanding of the Japanese cuisine is kind of like a, you know, person walking through the tori gate and the act of cooking is acting like a tori. I mean, I'm just pushing maybe towards too much to the architecture, but uh, it was a beautiful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The photographs are so tantalizing. I'm getting very hungry right now, but <laughs> it's wonderful to see the matsutake because it evokes so many, I think, aspects of seasonality, but also the very distinctive, the matsutake. I know um, myself growing up in Colorado, we would go matsutake hunting. And the way you could tell it was actually matsutake is through that particular scent of the matsutake. But you really sense the autumn coming and when I would see matsutake in Japan, it really gives this whole kind of sensation of um, that time. I'm not sure which one of the 72 seasons it is, <laughs> but building on what Hitoshi was saying of this kind of going through the gate, I, mean, I could see not only when you're preparing it, but the whole kind of foraging and the whole process of the ingredients and how they come together. But I wonder if you sense that um, beyond the, only the meal of the the whole kind of way um, you look to the particular ingredients and the combinations and how that build all together. Yeah, you really do feel it. I was actually kind of chuckling to myself in your intro, mentioning the population of the various places. <laughs> and I, I really do gravitate towards a more rural setting and the tend to be agricultural settings. And so for me, I think there's a real visceral connection because it's not just when I go to the kitchen to create a meal. It's in fact, when I run my errands, I am driving by the rice fields and I'm noticing that either they're ready for harvest or, oh, they must have been harvested this morning because they were there yesterday. You know, so there's this real feeling of the changing of the seasons and seeing the colors, the foliage, which is just starting to happen now. The ginkgo leaves are turning. And meanwhile, we have uh, ginkgo nuts in the market. So. Um, for me, living in a rural setting is really brings it to my life in a very full way. It's not just when I sit down to eat. It's really infused in the environment. You know, saga is really the whole kind of start of rice culture and not only rice, but shochu and other ways that it really infuses this whole kind of experience. But um was it distinctly different from growing up in Vermont or this kind of rural quality of really understanding the seasons I mean um, autumn is also very beautiful but yeah we definitely have our you know autumnal associations in Vermont of you know famous foliage and apples and pumpkins and those sorts of things I wonder if I lived in Vermont now if I would be more in tune with it I think I'm really in tune with it here in Karatsu just because I'm older I cook I'm interested in it from both the cook's perspective and also from the perspective of just living here and being in this environment. I think for me, it's being an adult and being in this stage in my life, I'm really attuned to it here. So if you are asked to move to Vermont again, then the, your approach towards the food will stay same or you think it will be different? Because the idea you mentioned about, I think can be applicable to any part of the world. It is and attitude. Right. So right. exactly. And we do actually spend um, part of the year in Maine as well. And so I am in tune with it there. And I definitely like I love foraging. I love doing whatever is available in that season and being really in tune with what's there. We're, we're generally there in the summer. So, you know, the fresh vegetables and the, the crops that are coming in. So I really do think it has to do with just being aware of it and interested. And if you seek it, you will find it wherever you are. I think what's also interesting things about your presentation is basically the food is acting as a way to feel the environment outside and also the time outside, right? It kind of acts as a kind of a medium to or interface in a way. So it's also interesting. And the question is how much it is also attached to the location. It is just a matter of the cost of shipping. So can we reproduce that in LA? That's a kind of a big question. It has to be there or it can be remotely experienced since it is an interface. 
I think it's a really interesting and it's a timely question because we can order things, we can receive things almost anywhere. And right. particularly now I've noticed there's such an interest in Japanese food. There are a lot of Japanese restaurants. There are a lot more ingredients available outside of Japan. And I do think about this myself, sort of what is the difference in experiencing it in its location? Because I do believe the atmosphere, the climate, the light, all of those things create something in our physicality, just as they create something in the rice in that moment. And so for me, I don't feel like you can replicate exactly anything like eating something that is in season in your location. However, it shouldn't deter people from exploring and experimenting and having fun. But um, this is much of the work I do is really not so much telling people, well, you could do this at home, you could try this as a substitute, but bringing, you know, encouraging people to come to Japan and to eat in Japan and feel the season and have that experience rather than try to replicate it outside. As you discuss the rice harvest and so forth, it reminds me of having the freshly harvested rice and, you know, what that means as opposed to how it be over time. And the whole soy culture, as you also described, I think becomes extremely interesting in comparison of, I once visited a Kikoman brewery for the soy sauce, and, but they were also looking to, instead of soy-based cuisine, an olive oil-based cuisine mm -hmm. in contrast, and how that is a kind of connective ingredient of that particular way. And when we think of Italy, olive oil certainly becomes that kind of connective element, but I'm very curious in terms of this you know, broader regional culture that you really talk about that you experience, but how those ingredients can really be understood through these seasons as you are cooking, as your continually inspires it, I guess, in terms of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's interesting. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of changes here in Japan. I think what you are referencing, there is a lot of other seasonings coming in, um, other ways of cooking in Japan, definitely a, a huge Western influence. I, I wish I could write in Japanese. I wish I could produce my, my website in Japanese sometimes because oftentimes I want to really just express how exciting it is to have this cuisine that's so beautifully tied to the landscape and to the locale. And, and I really hope it doesn't become abandoned even in the interest of exploring other flavors and tastes. Maybe, you know, we should ask Praley to jump into her second presentation. So then Our we second can course, this perhaps. Conversation. <laughs> 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 Too bad that we cannot taste it. Yes. <laughs> okay, um, so we can go ahead and start the second slideshow. And... Okay, so moving from the farms and the fields and the kitchen to the dining table, I'd like to talk next about ma in plating and presentation. So let's start with the table setting. An empty table is like an empty room full of potential and possibility. So how do we take that empty surface and prepare it for a meal? Similar to the placemat that is often used in the West, we find trays used in Japan a lot to define a single place setting. I really love trays um, because they're like the frame of a photograph. It's kind of like a place in which to isolate and arrange a scene. Broadly speaking, in Japan, foods are served each in their own vessel. So it's quite different from the American dinner plate that's piled high with a little bit of everything all spilling into each other. In Japan, each flavor combination is generally isolated and celebrated and given its own place to exist and its own setting where it remains pristine and separate from the others. I see this as an expression of ma in that each vessel creates a frame. It emphasizes the color and flavor of the food it contains. Japan is quite unique in its use of tableware. And in fact, I think it can be a little bit counterintuitive for those of us who are brought up in Western culture. In Japan, symmetry is avoided because symmetry is considered predictable, whereas asymmetry is considered intriguing and engaging. Also repetition is avoided because it's thought that one thing will stand out as special on its own, but if you add another of the same object, neither feels special or unique. So in embracing asymmetry and avoiding repetition, there's a lot of rhythm and tension that's created through contrast. In terms of tableware, you'll find a myriad of shapes from round to angular to altered. You'll find vessels of differing elevations from flat to elevated. 
Many different materials are used like glass, bamboo, wood, and of course, ceramics. And within ceramics, there are also many styles from clean and simple porcelain in, to rough unglazed stoneware to glazes in many, many colors and styles. And then there are the more decorative pieces with painted imagery and seasonal motifs. And just as the ingredients in Japan change based on season, so does the choice of tableware. You'll find more glass and crisp porcelain in the summer because it aesthetically has a cooling effect. And you'll find that warmer toned earthenware is used more in winter. So these choices in different kinds of pottery reflect the spirit of the season, just as the food in them reflects the season. Um, there's a quote that I've seen often associated with Ma that reads, pots are formed from clay, though the space inside them contains their essence. So though the example here is pottery, I think it's true of any vessel really, as well as of a room or a building. The physical structure of a thing serves to define an area of space and it's that space or that emptiness within that holds its essence. In Japan, um, when looking at the art of flower arranging, it's said that the space around the flowers is considered to be equally as important as the flowers themselves. And this harmony and balance between the two is considered ideal. And this principle holds true in Japanese plating as well. Here, vessels are never filled with food. General rule of thumb is that the food you're serving in a vessel shouldn't exceed 70% of its volume. So that empty space around the food gives it shape. It gives weight and focus to what's inside the vessel. And so in this way, that absence defines the presence, which I think is an expression of ma. For example, here you have some dishes that are served would be individual servings, you know, given one per person. And it also holds true when you're eating in a more family style where people might take from a larger vessel served um, in the middle of the table. And so regarding uh, presentation and plating, I just like to take a minute to emphasize that it also doesn't have to be so formal. A lot of the images you're seeing are, are quite formal settings. You can really apply these principles to a casual context as well. I think when it comes to table setting and plating and presentation, the most important aspect really is awareness and intention and being present in making conscious choices. There's really no right or wrong or faux pas to fear. As long as you're following your heart and act with intention, I think you'll experience ma in your meals and create a beautiful setting. Beautiful presentation again. <laughs> it's really interesting. Especially, I started to really think about actually the Western kind of uh, uh, plates are more about the set. You see the incredibly gorgeous, com you know, but the very unified sets of the you know, the tablewares and uh, plates and so on. But the Japanese thing, yes, there are certain kind of uh, combinations, but most of them are different. It creates more sort of a different kind of rhythm and the flow, and it's more dynamic than the static. And it, it's really interesting to actually see that. And then I started to think also your comment about the tray or the plate being like a frame of the photos to mm -hmm. capture certain momentum within mm -hmm. the, this kind of a frame. And I, I think it's true that uh, you have so many different kind of frame to capture different momentum of different things, which is passing through the season. Mm -hmm. and, and it's kind of interesting to see that as a frame to capture the moment and then yeah, the, all of a sudden, actually, I started to think about the Japanese sort of a food cuisine as a series of beautiful pictures, actually like the one you showed us. Yeah, I think as a photographer, I, I see the world that way. I'm sort of always drawing a boundary that eliminates what's external or, or irrelevant and bringing focus into what's relevant. And I think the placemat can do the same, serve the same purpose, but there's something particular, I think the weight and the body of a tray, it, it does that with more emphasis perhaps. It's almost like a, a stage for the food that it is um, there highlighted. Uh, it's so inspirational in so many ways. And I know of a number of architects who visit and are so impressed as you showed with this presentation because it's a composition of colors, textures, 
and how you not only see it, but you really taste it. I know some architects, there was a great modernist architect, Stemi Horiguchi, who I think would combine different textures of ingredients into um, really tasting as well as see things. And so it, it evokes that in seeing your presentation for me. And, you know, whether you see it literally as those ingredients or you start to imagine many different things that it evokes. The great architect, Le Corbusier, when he visited Japan, did some sketches of some of these obon, these trays. And um, if you look at some of his design, they do have a little bit of a resemblance to the composition of these ingredients. It's almost a kind of site plan of the different structures and elements. And so I do see these links, but the wonderful thing is that it's much faster to produce the meal than a building that <laughs> takes many months and years and so forth. It seems to be yeah. that much more satisfying. <laughs> yeah, you can, I have a you question. Can, no, I was just going to say, I think with a meal, you know, you can really play day to day and experiment and refine. It, it's a much faster paced activity. Uh, let's say if I actually interpolate this conversation, right, that Western cuisine is setting is more about creating the field, almost like a mathematical grid, mm -hmm. so that everything is kind of placed in the abstract sort of a spatial coordinates, versus to the Japanese cuisine is more about the agency, like a relationship of the things. So if it creates a different kind of a framing or the different way to place stuff within it. So I wonder, just using the Japanese arrangement, the setting, do you think that that, that changes the way people perceive the Western food? If you apply that method and presentation and then experience the Western food through that, that changes the way. I do. I think it does. I, we we do eat Western food sometimes. You know, when we want a, a quick night, we'll we'll throw together a pasta or something. And for me, yeah, I do feel like uh, the act of pulling out the pottery and the fact that the pottery itself has some character, meaning that I'm I'm not just reaching for the right size or shape. I'm reaching mm -hmm. for something that seems to suit the color or the the feeling of the food as well. So I think just that act of combining them and them both having the food and the plate having some sort of weight or contribution creates a scene in a way that's that's quite different in the West. So I, I do I sense that even here when I might plate, you know, a roast beef or some some sort of more Western. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, right? The framing and the way that uh, you actually arrange the actual food to interface being mm -hmm. modified can change its experience. So. The food itself isn't just about the taste and the flavor, but it kind of entire ambient through experience. And it's interesting. I really want to try hamburger in a Japanese way. I don't know how, but it could be <laughs> interesting. Yeah, for sure. And there are um, just relating to, I think, things both of you said. Um, I didn't get into as much detail today, but there are a lot of types of uh, moritsuke, which is the word for plating in Japanese, that actually reference nature. There are styles of plating, styles of arranging food um, that might replicate sort of mounding things up like a mountain or especially with slices of raw fish, sashimi, sort of displaying them in a way it's called nagare, it's a flow. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of concepts to plating that are not just about design. It's not just from the head, it's in fact reflecting the natural world and perhaps reflecting where the ingredients came from. So I think utilizing those notions in how we mm -hmm. present the food also again ties it to something larger than just a flavor or just a, a taste. Well and this whole notion of plating becomes very interesting for me of how you experience it. You know the bowl that you hold um, and eating that with chopsticks is very different than compared to um, using a fork and knife on a plate and mm -hmm. what that might kind of imply in terms of this whole process of um, experiencing. And I mean, I, I'm curious how much that might be conscious or something you might think about of how that actually is experienced or eaten, you know, with chopsticks versus 
fork and knife or just that kind of bodily experience? Yeah, I think it's usually influential, um, particularly coming from the perspective of the pottery and the vessel. I, I know from being married to a potter that it's the weight of the vessel, how the mm -hmm. foot of the vessel feels in mm -hmm. your hand is something that she considers quite a bit because often you pick it up, whether that's to drink a soup because we're not using spoons or whether that's even, you know, when you're serving yourself something from a central larger vessel, you generally pick it up and hold it in your hand while you take something out of it with chopsticks. Um, so there's this, you feel the warmth of the food through it, you feel the foot of the vessel and porcelain feels very different on the skin than stoneware does. So there's definitely a real tactile sense. How the lip feels against your own lip is very important right. because you might be drinking or you might be getting the last bit of sauce out of something and bringing the bowl up to your lips to do that. So it's really even with pottery, it's not just visual, it's tactile. It's a very important element. Yeah. During quarantine, I learned how to you know, make a sashimi mm. and uh, the, my friend told me that depending on how you cut the sashimi, then the taste is really different. It controls also the way that the piece of the fish absorb the shoyu, soy mm -hmm. sauce, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, also the way your mouth feels, so that it changes the flavor. So at the end, it's really interesting that the shape and uh, uh, somehow the, how, the texture can really change your experience. For sure, yeah. Yeah, the whole- I, I, I don't have a, that kind of technique though. <laughs> Grating daikon, depending on how hard you grate it, it can be spicier or sweeter. <laughs> so it really does, as you say, Hitoshi, about the cutting of the fish um, will really affect the flavor. Yeah, it does. What, and I think how we feel that day too affects how we feel. <laughs> So let's ask Crayley to jump into the last presentation and we can still continue this tasty conversation, I guess. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, so I'd like to end the uh, third presentation by talking about how we receive a meal, which I think we just touched a bit about that in the discussion. Um, so I'd like to explore the idea that ma is expressed in timing. And just as it's the space between the notes that defines rhythm, it's the space between dishes and between flavors that I think defines a meal. To illustrate this, we can look at kaiseki. Kaiseki is a course menu with a considered and predetermined set of dishes that unfold with rhythm and flow. And in kaiseki, one dish is served at a time and it's to be enjoyed in full before moving on to the next one. So the meal takes you on a journey of colors and textures and temperatures and flavors. And I talked earlier a bit about ma as the space between things that defines them in the context of physical space. But I think it's also expressed in the context of a meal unfolding in this way, like the acts of a play perhaps, or the movements of a symphony, the moments between the action, the reset, um, that pause is an essential element in creating definition in each successive set of flavors. So we replicate this a bit in the home setting as well. In our home, we eat in a style that's modeled after the kaiseki of tea ceremony. So some courses will be presented in individual dishes at each person's setting, and others are taken from communal serving dishes. In this case, when foods are served in larger vessels, family style, we each have a single dish called a torizada at our place setting. It's generally a small plate or a shallow bowl. And we'll eat a small portion of one or two things at a time and then clear our plate before serving ourselves a portion of something else. So we generally don't mix flavors too much. Our custom is really to experience and enjoy one set of flavors at a time. I love to cook, but many people in my family love to cook. So we realized that the meal has been prepared where each dish feels special and unique in flavor and presentation. So we really wanna honor that effort and appreciate each one. So circling back to the introduction where we heard that Ma integrates time and space, I think we can talk about the experience as a, of a, a meal as the integration of time and space. It starts with an ingredient's origin in the sea or mountains or fields, followed by its preparation in the kitchen, its arrangement in a vessel, and then those vessels arrangement on the table and ultimately culminates in the experience of eating, 
which itself is a journey through space and time. Each dish in both its flavor and experience of beauty, uh, it's an expression of beauty, sort of a unique moment that connects to, but is independent of what came before or what comes after. And for me in this way, food is like music. It's like a performance. It relies on interpretation and timing and it can never be repeated. You can cook and serve the same menu multiple times, but it will never look and taste exactly the same twice. And for me, this is an expression of Ma. So in closing, I'd like to just pull back for a minute and look at food and cuisine as one element in, from a wider perspective can be seen as a life well lived. I really like the illustration of Ma in reference to a Japanese garden, which has one, no one particular focal point, but rather reveals itself in different ways, depending on where you stand and how you move through the garden. And I think looking at the cultural arts, specifically the ones surrounding tea ceremony, like flower arranging or kaiseki or garden aesthetics, we see that while there's a lot of effort and intervention on the practitioner's part, there's really no artifice. Every action and expression stems from what exists in that time and in that place. And it's an aspect of living in Japan that's really made a lasting impression on me. And for me, it feels like an expression of Ma, this idea that the potential for beauty is embedded in the world around us. And that our task is to interact in harmony with the physical world and move through space and time with our senses open and engaged. And in this way, our whole environment becomes the garden. And as we move through it and shift our perspective, we'll always find new moments of beauty, like snapshots throughout the day. And for me, this is living with Ma. You know, what I really like about your presentation, even though you are showing the food, but I can see kind of a, your life behind it. You know, the way you live, and it's really uh, uh, interesting. And uh, I do really appreciate that. And also, of course, also your comment that the act of cuisine is somehow related to find out the beauty embedded in the world. That, mm -hmm. that statement, again, it's not about the making, but it is about finding. Finding and then giving frame, and then you kind of enjoy that because that creates or emphasize the mm -hmm. taste or, or experience of that particular moment. And when you explain cuisine through concept of ma very well. <laughs> And I'm very impressed. Thank you. For me, it really is, um, it's not constructing something, but rather isolating or arranging and emphasizing. And I think when you work with local ingredients and you work with things that are in season and you feel the season around you, it's actually much less complicated than it might seem. It's sort of, it becomes very natural and very harmonious, the act of doing so. And I think it, Cooking with intention means viewing the environment consciously in a way that's that's a really nice way to move through the world. There's something <laughs> so poetic about, about how you describe everything, and I'm very inspired by how you describe these tea ceremony and other aspects, which do bring together not only drinking and eating, but the whole experience of space and the garden, as you say. I mean, and that does really connect to Ma, but um, certain things that we can't experience here on the screen are um, aspects of temperature and um, the actual sound of food. We have the photograph mm. of what has been prepared, but the sound of eating, uh, whether it be daikon or something, if it's soft or if it's crunchy or, and I just am very curious about your thoughts in that regard since we can't experience it with you um, about these other space-time elements of whether it be temperature or sound that uh, might play a part in this experience. Yeah, I think, I think temperature is one for sure. Texture is a really important one in Japanese cuisine for sure. Um, and uh, it's interesting, I, I often laugh with people. One thing that took me a, a while, I'm not sure I'm even quite used to it, is the way that we eat because you want to eat hot things hot and fried things crispy. Um, throughout the course of a meal, oftentimes someone is up and in the kitchen. It's not a meal that you prepare everything, put it on the table and all sit down. 
And as a well-trained American girl, I sort of waited for everyone to be at the table before I start eating. But here you really can't do that because we want to experience those textures and those temperatures and that tactile feeling of food. So that means that generally you'll eat one thing and then someone will jump up to go get the soup, which is still warming on the stove or fry something in oil. Um, so there's definitely, that's a big element in the way we eat specifically is, you know, beating in general, of course, is putting one or two things out at a time, then going in to do the final mixing of a, a salad or something so that everything's fresh and, and ready to eat. It's a busy way to eat, but it's also a really delicious way to eat. I think though this attitude, right, to look into the making of Japanese cuisine can be uh, applicable to any part of the world. And I'm kind of curious what happens once you start to learn how to frame the season in particular way in each area, and then just, you know, find something and then turn it into the experience. And uh, I, I think uh, maybe you can really create the interesting sort of a Japanese cuisine in a global context. And uh, that's something that uh, maybe I want to uh, see by somebody or, you know, I I'm an architect, so I'm not sure if I can ever find such things, but uh, it's a really interesting way to look at the world. It's a really beautiful way. By the way, I kind of smelled and, and uh, taste the uh, uh, temperature through of the food from your picture somehow. That's great. Uh, That's something that I may be emergent, but mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that how strongly the image of the food can deliver the message. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the chestnuts that you are showing. Mm -hmm. I actually felt the texture mm -hmm. and I emerged in the taste, which could be completely wrong, <laughs> but uh, it was tasty. And uh, I, I think this kind of a, a, a powerful, uh, sort of a possibility of the food to deliver the message is such an interesting. This is the first time for me to sit in a kind of panel about the food. And I, yeah. I was kind of surprised that uh, how much the image of the food is strong. Maybe it's much stronger than the architecture in this setting. How do you think, Kensa? You all, I mean, the, the freshness of the um, food really is conveyed in these images. And I know um, Hitoshi is a real gourmet. And having returned from Japan, I, um, he told me he brought up back lots of food <laughs> from Japan that you can't necessarily get, I guess, in Los Angeles. But important those ingredients and how important the freshness and what that really means, um, I think it's so inspiring for not only for everyone, but um, I'm reminded of um, Kengo Kuma talking about a parallel between sushi and architecture of how, at least he argued, architecture should be more like sushi in terms of really thinking about the freshest ingredients and starting from those elements as the basis rather than conceived idea about what the design might be and how those really speak to us. But um, we also do have um, so many questions. Um, it's really inspiring our audience around the world, um, whether it's for um, dinner or for breakfast or <laughs> a midnight snack. I, I think maybe at some point we'll, or we should probably jump questions soon, but I, I think a lot of them do really talk about these differences or connections between what you're experiencing in Karatsu versus what your experiences might have been in Vermont or when you go to Maine. And actually one of the questions to you is this connection with seasons and food that one of our uh, audience members is asking if this journey would have happened and this kind of exploration had you not traveled to Japan and whether this is actually from asking as a former chef who recently emigrated to Japan and feels like he's an in to your um, meal. <laughs> uh, that's an interesting, I think some form of it would have happened. Um, I did the way I grew up. Uh, my parents were hippies straight out of the 70s. So we always had a vegetable garden and 
we're eating fresh food um, from there and, and very in tune with seasons in that way, as much as you can be in New England, which goes quite dormant for a, a big part of the year. So that was always a part of my life and an interest I had eating that way, eating seasonally and being aware of that. But I just think landing in Japan brought it, it emphasized it so much and also seeing it in the context of these micro seasons, I think is a very different way of seeing it than dividing the year into four very broad general seasons. Um, and having spent a lot of time in Japan, when I go back to Maine or go back to Vermont, I do sense more of the micro seasons. I do sense these subtle shifts from day to day and from week to week, which I'm sure I was doing intuitively just living there, but I think I have a more of a recognition of it and a, an understanding of it. And it piques my curiosity of, okay, well, I wonder what's in the market now, or I wonder what variety of apples are ripe now that we could pick or and I also would just say, I think there's been a cultural shift in the States, such a fascination with food and with cuisine mm -hmm. in general. People are foraging, people are growing vegetables, people are you know, cooking at home more than they ever did before. And I'm sure I would have fallen into that trend as well, but I, I certainly do it with this perspective that I've developed and I attribute to living in Japan. One, one question. Um not only thinking about the United States, but um, perhaps connections to Scandinavia. I mean, obviously there's the world famous restaurant of Noma and that aspires to this foraging and way to capture those ingredients in the cuisine. But um, whether you might see some of those connections in perhaps Scandinavia, actually I remember in, when I, or in Norway, they had a um, Norwegian sushi of having Norwegian salmon <laughs> done in a slightly Norwegian way, but what that kind of in between space of these cuisines might be in your mind or whether there is a kind of fusion of those ideas. Sure. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I think Japan's cuisine has had an influence globally for a long time, particularly in the realm of chefs and professional cooking. I think it's wonderful, you know, we see it coming out of Noma and I think it's being expressed in a lot of different places now. And I really see it from the perspective of taking a very modern high-end approach and going back to a more native way of eating, a more traditional way of eating, which mm -hmm. was looking for what exists in that time and in that place, and then doing some sort of interesting treatment. So I think it's a wonderful time to be interested in food and eating food. Um, Unfortunately, we can't get around the world the way we used to right now, but mm -hmm. um, I think the most important concept and what I, I really, I mean, I love going to restaurants like that now and then, but to be honest, for me, it's much more soulful when it's practiced at home and when it's a part of your life and in the place that you live. And so I think if, if restaurants like that can set an example and inspire people to be more conscious and more in tune with what they're eating on their own plates in daily life. Uh, that's perhaps where the greatest benefit is. So maybe it's about time to go for Q&A. So, so can... uh, many, um, I'm drawing from many of the questions that uh, are in the Q&A, but one building on what you just mentioned about the everyday versus the kaiseki is about this kind of difference, uh, whether they be of class presentation, but um, you know, how you think about not only the everyday, but you know, like the izakaya or um, street food versus the very kind of exquisite kaiseki that we see. I think it's all wonderful and it's all to be experienced and enjoyed. Um, and I think we each have our own particular tastes. We might gravitate to one style of food over another. I personally am very, influenced by kaiseki because of how it informs how I would like to live day to day and how I would like to eat day to day. But that doesn't mean I don't love a good bowl of ramen when I'm on the run. Um, you know, I think <laughs> there's a time and a place for all of that. And I think also just in the day to day, you know, there are definitely days where I do go to the market and buy fish and prepare a really beautiful meal. And there are days where I get caught up in work and I'm late and I'm rushing and for me, it's either one is fine. For me, it's really about just taking a few minutes to set the table, 
even if I'm pulling leftovers out of the fridge to find a beautiful piece of pottery to present it in. It's those small gestures that really let you pause and really experience the moment. And so I think it can run the gamut from the highest of high end to street food to leftovers to take out um, as long as you have this consciousness and approach of trying to enjoy and be present in the moment with it. And speaking of small gestures, there's a question about whether you uh, spend considerably more time washing dishes in Japan than um, you do in the U.S. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> uh, it's not the one plate dinner here. And again, this is, you know, I, I can't speak to all families across Japan. This is I live in a family of potters. You know, there's pottery around. We use it. We use a lot of it. So there's definitely a lot of time spent cleaning up and doing dishes. But again, for me, it's just, it's part of the experience. I don't mind it. It's, uh, it's part of appreciating the pottery, taking good care of it, uh, making sure we handle it with care and put it away at the end of the night. It's this way of being with objects the same way we are with food, um, being conscious and present. But yeah, there are some nights I eat with my in-laws and I'm up until 10 p.m. just cleaning up the kitchen. <laughs> it's just part of it, you know, not every day, but. But uh, uh, actually it's interesting. I mean, I don't want to compare the barbecue with Japanese thing, but there's certain things that kind of similar to that. I do enjoy doing little barbecue in my garden, right? Mm -hmm meaning the little, you know, the yakitori, and I prepare all the yakitori, put it in a stick, and then the, and then while I'm drinking, and then I set up the garden, and then also I have to be the one who cleans this barbecue grill. Just I can't let anybody do it. It's a part of the ritual to me. And uh, I, I think if you actually interpret this as an experience, and then that this experience is more like a total sort of a, a process of preparing and eating and talking with your family and then cleaning also. So that's something that maybe happens once or twice a week, but still I do really appreciate that. And then, you know, the, the discussion we had today about sort of a finding something beautiful or uh, tasty in your life and then try to capture it and then lay it out in front of you. It's such a beautiful sort of a, a experience. And uh, I'll be, I'll try to be more conscious when I do my own yakitori party. <laughs> no, but I, I completely agree. I think, um, you know, the tools we use in the kitchen, I've bought a lot of wonderful tools for cooking Japanese food. I have a beautiful set of knives that you know, if you even look at them, they'll rust. You know, you have to keep them very clean. You have to keep them dry. But for me, taking care of them, I, I have the same spirit. I love them as objects. I love the, the purpose they serve. And so it doesn't bother me to put that effort into them. There is a quick question of um, if you do have a favorite season or um, a favorite type of uh, pottery, um, season uh, right now actually is one of the best seasons to be cooking in Japan, autumn, sort of early autumn. Uh, the rice has just been harvested. There are so many seasonal ingredients you saw today, ginkgo nuts and matsutake coming out, the new rice, lotus root. It's, it's a really engaging and fun time of year to be cooking. I also really love early spring. Um, because that's when mm -hmm. there's a lot to be foraging for. We get very busy running around the hills collecting wild vegetables. Um, it's just a really, those two times, I'd say October, November, and then March, April are times when it's just every day there's something new and you get really excited. There's so many combinations to make. Oh, I think I think everyone is for my getting dinner. very hungry. <laughs> um, but um, especially not being able to travel now, I'm really uh, longing for so much of this. Um, one of our um, audience members is really thanking you for such a beautiful presentation. But uh, she was saying that she was presented with by two different people with two large matsutake. Um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, felt a disjunction between Japan and uh, Cambridge. 
um, the mushrooms really brought that experience together. Uh, it was a much more visceral connection and um, that your discussion, the continuity between ingredient, the process of cooking and the presentation made immediate sense. And um, with the matsutake in my hand, really wanting to thank you for such an inspirational description. Thank you so much and enjoy that matsutake. One of the best <laughs> that I ever had was forged by a friend of mine in Maine. So there are some good ones in New England. Yeah. And, you know, whether there's the phrase, um, you know, ichigo, ichie, one time, one experience that we often say with tea ceremony, it seems like this is also the ichigo, ichie, that's very much this ma space time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we can talk about this forever, but uh, I think it's about time to actually ask for Kaifu-san again to close this talk. But thank you. Uh, Preli, and uh, it was really, really fun to talk about your uh, presentation. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to join you all from Japan. Thank you. That's right. You're in Japan. Yes. <laughs> Thursday morning. Well, thank you so very much to all the speakers. What an engaging and inspirational dialogue, along with the beautiful photos of the environment, the nature, and the, the cuisine. And um, I was really absorbed into listening. So I almost almost forgotten about my last role to conclude the, the programs. But the photos give us a sense of uh, serenity and tranquility, but they are still very, can convey as Hitoshi was talking about, we can feel that almost that, that we can taste it and smell it and it's so dynamic. And so thank you so very much. And I also appreciate the audience for, I, I was looking at the, the chat box and it's, so lively. There is um, there are many lively discussions and comments, and I don't think that the panelists had a chance to read them. But I would uh, we would uh, make sure to deliver them to uh, Prairie uh, Hitoshi and and Ken later on. And thank you also to the audience for many many questions that you submitted. I'm sorry that we could not get uh, to cover all of them, but uh, again uh, we uh, share those questions with the panelists as well. Prairie, uh, can I ask you one last favor? Yes. Um, I know that you're living in very beautiful natural environment and I asked you to close the window because of the sunshine, but do you mind rolling up your blinds so, so people can see your beautiful uh, setting? Oh. Wonderful. <laughs> we envy you. <laughs> Beautiful autumn day. Yes, well, thank you so very much. We are hoping to bring to the audience another uh, round of the Ma webinar in the future, so please uh, stay tuned. We are currently hosting an exhibition at our gallery um, at Japan House in Hollywood, Wave New Currents in Japanese Contemporary Graphic Arts, which showcases the work of 55 Japanese graphic artists and illustrators. I hope many of you will have a chance to visit our exhibition if you haven't yet. As part of the exhibition related programs, next week on November the 4th, we'll be hosting a webinar on the relationship between art and advertising in the Edo period. So please uh, try to sign up and, and uh, join us. We encourage you to stay up to date on all our programs and events by subscribing to the Japan House LA newsletter. Today, uh, when you exit the program, please take a moment to fill out our survey so that we can continue providing you high quality content that is relevant to the areas of your interest. So thank you again, Prairie, Hitoshi, and Ken for the wonderful panel discussion. And thank you to the audience as well. And I hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.